so uh, today uh, we were going to finish up um, chapter 20, um, the electrochemistry stuff, and uh, then just, just a couple old problems I wanted to start out with, and we'll see how far we get, but uh, not too much left to do. Uh, we have, I think, only one equation left that I need to share with you guys, if I'm remembering correctly now. One. Two, sorry, two equations, yep. So essentially two equations uh, left to share with you guys um, that relate to very specific problems that can come out of this chapter. Uh, and so it's, um, how do I wanna put this? I guess we, there's gonna be a couple of problems that we'll probably start to work through on Monday uh, related to these last two uh, equations that we'll talk about today. Uh, but for the most part, these relate to specific problems that can come out of the, the electrochemistry chapter. <laughs> oh. Oh. Come on in, right? Oh. Everybody wakes up late, jeez. Thank you guys for doubling the attendance to class, though. So. <laughs> the other, I'll be honest, the other guys were feeling kind of awkward. They're like, oh, man, I didn't get the memo now. <laughs> but anyway, as I was sharing here, um, We've got about uh, two equations left to kind of talk through uh, for this chapter and uh, relating to two specific types of problems that come out of this. Um, and then I've got a couple of uh, practice problems today. And then uh, Monday, I'll probably pop open a quiz for you guys on this stuff uh, on chapter 20. Um, and we'll just finish, well, no, let's do this. So Monday, we'll, we'll do a couple more practice problems and then Wednesday, I'll, I'll have a quiz up for you guys. So maybe you can work through a couple examples, and then you guys have a quiz up, um, for chapter 20 there. Sound good? Cool. Um, let's see, you guys still have a couple labs left, right? Uh, for this more. semester? Just one more? Yeah. So next week is your last lab also? Cool. And um, after we are uh, done with the electrochemistry stuff there, so probably uh, Wednesday or maybe Monday, just kind of depending, uh, we will move into talking a little bit about the uh, last set of topics which we'll discuss, which will be um, organic chemistry, just an intro to organic, just to kind of get you guys ready for the fall semester there, uh, and maybe a little bit of inorganic stuff too, uh, getting ready for, um, you know, like I think biochemistry is probably what you guys will see that coming again there, but we'll see exactly what we get. Uh, what I did want to share with you guys though is I was uh, uh, helping Dr. Barbosa yesterday, um, and he was giving an exam for his biochemistry class. And um, so the exact topics that they were covering in biochemistry, so the second semester of biochemistry here, they were talking about uh, cell potential, right? So what they were looking at, and there were questions on the exam, they were basically calculating the potential for this set of reactions. And they had a giant list of uh, uh, potentials for different enzymes and different proteins and all these kind of things, right? So reduction, half potentials for uh, these enzymes, and they use those to predict the equilibrium constants for these uh, reactions that they were discussing, right? And they use that to predict uh, a little bit about delta G, right? And calculate the free energy and whether it's spontaneous and these kind of things, right? So the point that I'm always trying to get across to you guys is remember, why are you guys taking general chemistry? Well, especially if you guys are going along and moving along in biochemistry and even biology, right? You guys will end up seeing this material again, right? Now, the unfortunate side of this, or fortunate, depending on your own personal opinion, is you won't see this again for maybe another two years, right? Because we have to go through organic, where you don't really talk about potentials too much there, but then when it comes back in biochemistry, uh, you guys will see all this exact material again, and that's the point, okay? And this is the good news. The, the exact equations that we're using in this chapter are the exact same equations that you'll use when you guys get to biochemistry, right? And that's also one of these things that, may, uh, that maybe makes this class challenging, right? Because it's a, technically a 100 level class, right? But then you use this stuff for a 400 level class also, right? So you got some fairly complex material that's tucked away in here, right? But the point being, the better you guys understand this now, or the more time you put into you know, making sure it sticks in the brain, right? When you guys get to biochemistry, right, you guys are gonna be ahead of the curve, okay? Because equilibrium and potentials and Gibbs free energy and all this kind of stuff that we've been learning here will show up again, I promise. 
right, that is one of these promises that I made to you guys, that I will not teach you guys something that isn't useful in one of your future classes in chemistry, right? Or, and that's not excluding the other ones, right? But I'm just saying, at least from the chemistry uh, curriculum, you will see this stuff again, okay? But I had some of my students, I saw they were taking the exam yesterday, right? And they didn't remember these equations. Very disappointing, but that's okay. You guys won't have that problem. Right? <laughs> the overwhelming confidence, right? <laughs> anyway. Oh, uh, sorry, yeah, before we get started, then we'll, um, um, uh, we'll get started with prayer, and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this here. But Lord, we just thank you. Uh, we just thank you for a wonderful week. We just thank you for uh, that we've made it this far, and we thank you for the blessing of another day and another new opportunity, Lord. Uh, we just pray today that uh, you pour uh, into our lives, Lord. Uh, we need you to just uh, strengthen us, to grow us, to fill us, Lord, so that we can spread that to others around us and so that we can share you with those around us, Lord. But at the end of a nice week, but a busy week, Lord, we just pray that you give us your strength and that you lend us uh, the ability, to, or the, the, the strength just to make it through this day, Lord, and give us the ability to carry out the task that you've set before us. And Lord, we just pray to continue to uh, just spark that fire in our hearts, Lord, just to seek after you, just to, just to get to know you better, Lord, just to grow our relationship with you so that you can strengthen us each day, Lord. We just pray that we keep ourselves humble, and we pray that we uh, just find our way to spend that time with you meaningful each day, Lord. We ask this in your name. Amen. All right. So uh, we have this equation uh, here, which is the Nernst equation, which is probably one of the most important equations that come out of this chapter. Uh, and so the question then should be, well, why is that? Well, so if you remember, so far we've been mostly dealing with these E naughts, G naughts, K naughts, right? All these different uh, typical uh, quantities, okay, uh, that we've been calculating. And we have to remember what that little not symbol means, right? So remember the little not symbol means like standard state, okay? And we had a definition earlier, right? We had a definition earlier of what the standard state is, okay? Uh, we had, it's based off of concentration, right? Um, and we, it also uh, specifies a specific temperature and all these kind of things along the way, right? But as I was looking through that exam yesterday there in biochemistry, often, right, there's not one molar concentrations of things in your cells, right? That, that's, a, that's a pretty high solid, that's a pretty high concentration, okay? Temperature is different, right? It's always freezing in this room, and then the, 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 the classroom I teach in in the afternoon is way hotter, okay? So temperature changes. Right? So we have to figure out a way of how we can account for these differences from, let's say, the ideal, right, from the ideal conditions, right? And I, remember, ideal is just kind of a, I guess, maybe a colloquial term, right? These non-standard states. And that's what the Nernst equation is going to do for us, right? So remember, we've been calculating E naught of the cell, okay? This is what we were doing for the last basically two days there, right? We were using the uh, table 20.1 or appendix, uh, what is it, E? I always forget. What's the one with the potentials? Have you got a C, E, whatever it is? E, E, okay, right? Or we were using appendix E there to figure out the, the redox half reactions to grab the information about what's happening at the cathode or the anode, right? So that's what we've been doing all along. And all those assumptions, or excuse me, or all those values are based off of the assumptions of a standard state, okay? So this value right here is what we've been doing so far. And then you guys see some hopefully familiar other characteristics in here. We see R and we see T, we see lowercase n, we see F. Okay, well hopefully at this point in your guys' chemistry career, I don't have to explicitly tell you what all those different things mean. However, right, for the sake of completion, and just to pad out the time of the class, I'm going to go through each one, right? <laughs> so anyway, R and T, right? R is the gas constant, T is the temperature. Now remember, I say this every time, and then still, when some people go through on um, exams or quizzes, they forget, right? Whenever we're dealing with one of the gas constants, we always have to make sure that temperature is in Kelvin, okay? So again, there's nothing going to be different here, right? Uh, N is the number of moles of electrons that are going to be transferred, so make sure you guys have a balanced equation here, 
right? So if you're dealing with silver, right, we're only transferring one electron. If we're dealing with zinc, we got two, aluminum three, right? Make sure you guys are paying close attention to a balanced uh, transfer of electrons, okay? F is the Faraday constant. That's the, um, what we talked about last time there, right? The uh, 96,500, right? So uh, uh, 96,500. Uh, and that natural log of Q. Okay, so what in the world is Q? So Q, right, is our reaction quotient, okay? So Q implies what, though? What, is, what does Q tell us? Or what is Q useful for? Telling us how to approach equilibrium. Yeah, are we at equilibrium or not, right? If Q is equal to K, right, then we are at equilibrium, and it changes uh, the values of our, or it changes the values that we can use, right? But remember, Q is just an expression of the equilibrium, and so it's gonna be concentration of products over reactants. Is it gonna be any different here? No, right? So now we have a way of relating, well, what if we don't have a saturated or one molar solution? What happens if we have different concentrations of the uh, solutions of the metals uh, that we're trying to build a voltaic cell with, okay? So remember, this is just Q, products over reactants. We can simplify R, T, and N, right, just given uh, a couple of conditions here. If we're at 298K, and right, you see these are the same values uh, for the equation that we talked about uh, last time there, right? How can we calculate E naught of the cell um, and relate it to K, okay? So that, this is the only difference, right? Remember last time we calculated K, we used a very similar equation, right? But if we're not at equilibrium, if we're not at the standard state, then we just have to use this equation here. Good? Nothing too different here, right? So now we have a way of calculating E of the cell based off of the other information that we can get out of the reaction there, or the, the balance equation. All right. Perfect. And that is. So let's see, we got an equation that has one, two, three, four, five variables in it, right? What are we given information about? Well, we're given E naught of the cell, okay? Although, could you guys calculate E naught of the cell if I didn't give it to you? Yes. Yeah, right? Remember, E naught of the cell is equal to, right? Is equal to, right, E naught of the cathode minus E naught of the anode. Right? The values that come from the half reactions here. Okay? But we get a D here, right? So you have information about this. 
Do you have concentrations given for the products and the reactants? Well, essentially what we're asking, right, is can you guys write an expression for the equilibrium for this reaction? Who cares if it's a redox or not? It's still a reaction. All right, so if I ask you guys to write the equilibrium expression for this, remember we've got some solids in there. Those aren't part of our expression, right? They're lumped in together with the, uh, with the, uh, with the constant, all right? So we just have products, which is zinc, right, over the reactants, which is common. Good. Now this is important, right? Don't forget that we need to balance our reaction based off of the amount of electrons that are transferred, okay? So make sure you always have a balanced redox reaction here because how do you write your expression for Q? It's concentration raised to the stoichiometric coefficient, right? So if you don't have a balanced equation, you might not have the right answer that comes out of your expression for Q here, okay? So we have cell, we have product, we have reactants. What's N in this case? How many electrons are transferred? Two. Two. Right? How do we get that information? Well, here it's kind of easy, right? We have two plus and two plus. If we don't have that explicit information, how do you guys figure out how many electrons are transferred? Oxidation states, got it? So remember, each part of this equation is something that we talked about in this chapter. Our N, we get from our oxidation states, E naught of the cell, we talked about how to build a, uh, a voltaic cell and figure out what the cathode and the anode is, right? Products and reactants, that's from a previous chapter, right? The, uh, how, to, how to get an expression for Q, okay? So everything in here is kind of nicely and neatly tied together into this one equation here, right? So then it just becomes a matter of the uh, filling in the blank, right? So E of the cell, 1.10 volts, minus 0 0.0592 volts over Q, right, the number of electrons, log of uh, 5.0 over uh, 0 0.1, okay? And if I did all this, I've got 1.05 volts uh, for E of the cell. Not too scary, right? Just making sure we get the right information into the right variables there. All right. So if um, we can, or, or we can set up something called a concentration cell. And so what this means is if we have zinc at both the cathode and the anode, okay? So if you have zinc at both the cathode and the anode, we can actually measure a potential for this, right? But what we have to have is a difference in concentration. So we have some kind of dilute concentration at one end and one kind of, some kind of concentrated solution at the other. So for argument's sake, let's say that this is 0 0.01, right? Our dilute concentration. Let's say over here we have a uh, one molar, right? 0 0.01 and one molar. Oops. Okay. So then essentially what's going on here is that zinc, whoa, right? Zinc solid, right? going to make zinc 2 plus aqueous, right, plus 2 electrons, okay, and this is our 0 0.01 here, right, that's the, that's the concentration of that, and at the other end, right, at the other end we have zinc 2 plus, plus 2 electrons, goes to make zinc solid, and this is our 1, okay. with me on this one? The easy thing about this is they balance themselves, right? Because if you're oxidizing or reducing yourself, you ought, it's, right? it's automatically balanced. Okay, so what does this simplify to, right? What does this simplify to? Well, if we're just looking 
at what is part of our reaction or what we need to think about for our equation, right? This simplifies to zinc two plus, right? Going to zinc two plus, right? 0 0.01. So can you guys calculate what E of the cell is going to be given this information? So what's E of the cell? What's the potential for this cell going to be? No, you're going to have to use, use the equation I just did here, right? Anytime I ask you a question about a, a cell that's not at standard state, right? We have concentrations that are not at one, right? Then we're going to have to use the equation that we just talked about. This is what we have. Got the same equation there, so we ask the same question. What do we have information about? Well, we got the concentration of the product and the reactant there in blue and green. We figured that out. Oops, I already gave you the answer here. That should be M, right? But right, we're dealing with zinc 2 plus, right? We're going to be transferring two electrons. We got that. What's E naught of the cell going to be? Hmm. How do we figure out E naught of the cell for this? But what is E naught of the cell equal to. Take a peek at that. Okay, so let's bring this idea out. So E naught of the cell right, is equal to what? E naught at the cathode, right? And there's E naught at the anode. Good. So just to review a little bit, what reaction happens at the cathode? Reduction happens at your cathode, okay, and that means oxidation has to happen at your anode. What is getting reduced? What species is getting reduced at the cathode? Well, it's your zinc, right? Everybody with me on this? What's, get, what's getting oxidized at the anode? Zinc also. So without looking at numbers, what does, what does that mean in terms of E naught? Let's say that it costs $10 to reduce zinc. Okay, you guys with me on this? It costs $10 to reduce zinc, yeah? How much would it cost to oxidize zinc then? You would get back the $10, right? Because they're opposite transactions. If it costs something to do, right, to do the reduction, then you gain that back if you do the opposite reaction. You guys with me on this? 
Now, of course, we don't deal with things in dollars. We deal it with volts, right? So where do we find the information for how much it costs to oxidize or reduce something? Table. In the tables, right? <laughs> so if we put some numbers with this, right? If we look it up, let's see if I can find it without scrolling all the way back up. Yep, there it is, right? Uh, remember in the table it says that zinc, right? Two plus, plus two E minus, goes to make zinc solid. And that is negative 0 0.763, right, volts. So there's our reduction half reaction. And reduction happens at the key, uh, at the key thode, the cathode, <laughs> right? So here's our $10, right? That's what it costs us to do it, so we put that here. And then what goes in E anode? Well, negative 0 0.76 goes here. What goes here? positive 0 0.76, right? So we end up subtracting it from itself. So what is E naught of the cell when you have two identical metals getting reduced or oxidized? Zero. Zero. You guys with me on this? It costs as much to reduce as, it, as you gain to oxidize it. Everybody following along with this? That's all it means. Now if you forget this on the exam, guess how you can figure this out? I'm just filling in the blanks here, right? It's still going to hold true. We're not doing any kind of magic here. We're just saying, hey, you know, cathodes and anodes, reduction and oxidation, are opposite reactions. So it's going to cost as much as we gain to do the opposite here. Okay? So we know, based off of this, that E naught of the cell then is equal to zero. Okay? And then we can just fill in our products and our reactants. In blue there, it was uh, 0 0.01, right? And our reactants. was one. Good? So E of the cell. Uh, was a whopping, let's see what I get. 0 0.0592, right? What does this tell us? Even if we have a difference in concentration, there is going to be a certain potential that we can measure out of that, right? We can create a battery based off of differences in concentrations there. about uh, a question that gets asked uh, typically when dealing with this chapter is how much of a metal can we deposit or how much of a metal can we electroplate, okay? And so when you see a question that's asking about how much can we deposit or how much gets electroplated, it is asking you basically to calculate the mass of what's going on in the voltaic cell there, right? So if you remember my I like big red cats thing, right? We talked about one of the anodes, or excuse me, one of the uh, electrodes is getting bigger, right? It is increasing in mass. And so that's what they're asking you. You're saying, hey, how, what is the change in mass at one of these electrodes, okay? And so we're gonna just have to use a certain string of equations to basically relate electrons to uh, how much of it gets deposited, okay? So, Let's start up here at the top. So assume that we are uh, reducing copper, okay? So copper two plus, and we add two electrons, and we turn an aqueous solution of copper into a solid chunk of copper, okay? Now that solid copper, we could separate it from the solution, it's got a certain mass, and we could weigh that, okay? And that's what we're trying to figure out. Now, if you take a look at the reaction, for every two moles of electrons, right, we can make one mole of copper. That's now gonna be our stoichiometric ratio, right? That's what we're gonna use to relate how much copper solid we can make based off of how many electrons are transferred, the total number of electrons. 
But there's our ratio. For every two electrons we transfer, we make one mole of copper solid, okay? Thinking about it, charge is equal to current times time, okay? And so charge as a coulomb is equal to an ampere second, okay? This was one of these, if you go back to the beginning of the notes, I said, hey, this is gonna be an important value to remember. This is how we're gonna relate the time to the charge, okay? So this is where this is coming back. So one coulomb is equal to one ampere second. So now we can relate time to electrons and charges and all these things are gonna to come together to tell us the mass of the, uh, the electrode that gets um, plated there, okay? So let's follow along here, okay? So if we have current, right? That's charge times time. We can convert that into charge. Using Faraday's constant, remember Faraday's constant is a value of coulombs per, right? Per, uh, coulombs per second, okay? So we can convert that into moles of electrons. Moles of electrons we can convert to stoichiometry. Um, by using stoichiometry, we can convert to moles of the copper, moles of whatever metal it is, and then moles of the metal we can convert into mass just using our molar mass, okay? So when you see a question like this, it's just merely an exercise of, hey, can you guys follow the chain of the units that are going with the values that you guys have been calculating? Okay? So if we're given current, or if we can figure out current, we can calculate charge to moles to moles to mass. All right, so let's put this all into play here. All right. Typical question, determine the mass of copper plated onto an electrode from a copper two plus solution by the application of 10 ampere currents for 10 minutes, okay? So they give us some kind of amps, so they give us an amount of time, and they ask us how much of the copper gets plated, okay? So first things first, figuring out our charge. Okay, that's the first thing we gotta do. Amperes, right? times the time converted into seconds is gonna give us our charge there, okay? Everybody with me on this one? Okay. So we take that value, right? There's our charge. Faraday's constant, right? Relating uh, uh, coulombs to moles of electrons, okay? For every one mole of copper, we have to transfer two moles of electrons and then the molar mass, and that tells us how much it is, okay? Is this math that complicated? No, what's the complicated part about this? Just following the units is what it is. And making sure you have a balanced equation for how many electrons you got to transfer with it, okay? So if you're given amps, just convert it into uh, charge, take your amps, multiply by the seconds you're given, and then just follow through with this, set of, this uh, string of equations here, okay? That's all there is to it. So if you see a question on the exam, and I ask you how much metal gets produced after you're running, you know, running a, a cell for a specific time, this is what I'm asking you guys to do, okay? And we'll run through probably an example of this on Monday there when, uh, when we uh, look at a couple of the examples out of the chapter. Good? You know what, we'll do that one on Monday then. So, that sounds good, yeah, we'll, we'll start with that one on Monday, cool. All right, that is basically the end of uh, this chapter here, okay? So we got one more chapter that's gonna show up on the final exam, all right? Remember that we stopped, uh, we didn't really, what did we do on this last exam here, right? We stopped at section, what was it, 20.2, right, is what it was, where we're doing the balance in redox reactions and acids and bases. So at the final exam is cumulative, so we're adding that second part there of chapter 20, and then we're going to talk about the organic stuff. Good? All right. So I've got a couple of questions for you guys. Let's see. Is this it? We don't want that. There, that looks good. following. 
order of increasing strength. as oxidizing agents. Oxidizing of strength, or excuse me, it's oxidizing agents. So, first question, what in the world is an oxidizing agent? They like oxidize whatever is getting oxidized so they get reduced. So, they are going to get reduced, right? They are the agents, they are the things that cause oxidation, right? They're the things that cause something to get oxidized, so they themselves get reduced, okay? Okay, so this question then could be asked, uh, which one of these is easier, right, to get reduced? You guys follow along with what I'm saying here, right? If I'm saying increase, you know, rank their increasing strength of oxidizing agent, it's the same thing as saying, you know, rank the following in order of increasing ease of reduction. Got it. Now, do we have a, is this something I expect you guys to memorize? You're like, uh, I hope not, right? <laughs> Right? What is this really? What is this question really an exercise in? Can you guys read tables. the tables? Right? What tables? Well, somebody wrote a note on this table here. Right? They said, "Please help me." Right? <laughs> is that what I'm? No. Right? I'm talking about table twenty point one or the tables at the end of the chapter there in your appendix. Right? Because how are those tables organized? Let me just switch back over. So these tables are what? They're the reduction half reactions. What do these values mean? This is, the, this is one of these key parts of this, right? Fluorine plus 2.87, wow! 2.87! Isn't that amazing? No. <laughs> Thank you, that's what I was... Right? <laughs> right, but the point is that it's not necessarily that it's 2.87, it's that it's plus 2.87. Versus at the bottom of lithium, that it's minus 3. What does it mean then? It means that what? The more positive something is, the more likely it's going to get reduced. It's easier to reduce it, right? If it's down here at the bottom, the harder it is to get reduced. The easier it is to what? Oxidize it. Got it? So how do you answer that question then? Well, you look at your table and you find what? These values here. Got it? 
Everybody with me on that? So if I take a look at the stuff in the book, okay, I find for uh, nitrate, I got uh, plus 0 0.96 volts. Okay. For silver, I got plus 0 0.80 volts. And for this, I got uh, plus 1.33 volts. Good. Where did I get that information? I just found these specific half reactions in the charts, in the tables. And it's going to be specific to these, okay? So make sure you guys are picking the right uh, charge, right, for the different metals. If you remember some of the examples that we had, we had iron 2 plus and we had iron 3 plus. So make sure you're finding the right reduction half potential for the information that's given, okay? So what does this information tell us? Well, the strength as an oxidizing agent, or which one is easier, right, to get reduced, right, that's going to be the strongest. So if we're just following along with our values here, right, silver is going to be the weakest, and then nitrate, right, and then our dichromate. This is a fantastic question. And if this wasn't an exam, guess what the follow-up question for this would be? Why? Explain your answer, right? Explain why. And the way I, or what I'd be looking for is some rationale between how you looked at the voltages and what that tells you in terms of its strength as an oxidizing agent or how easy it is to get reduced. Sound good? Do you guys get the point of this question, though? Hey, read the tables. That's what I'm saying. Because that's where your information is coming from. Much like for the first half of Gen Chem, I said, know the periodic table, know the periodic table, know the periodic table, right? Here for this chapter, I'm saying you gotta understand those, the, the redox half reaction tables. That's what's gonna give you your information. Sound good? All right. Let's see here, do we wanna do this one? So we have a voltaic cell. That is this. We have nickel and we have europium. And we make this voltaic cell and we measure that E naught of the cell is equal to 0 0.07 volts, okay? So we made a battery, we measured its potential, we have its um, E naught of the cell here, right? So the question, what is the E naught for the reduction of europium. So what is the potential or what is the E naught for europium getting reduced? Let's see what you guys come up with.
back it up and come back. No, that, that's what this question is, right? Uh -huh. You're not going to find out what on the table. Like, yeah, this is easy, right? <laughs> <laughs> but you are going to, but I have to give you information about, uh, right, this is the equation that we need, and there's three variables. Mm -hmm. So I gave you information about that, right? That's this, mm -hmm. right? And so now you need to figure out what other information you have, right? And you're right, you got to look at the table, but the erosion is not going to be on there, right? Okay. So, but you will find the nickel on there. And then the question is, is nickel at the cathode or nickel at the anode? Okay. the equation that we're going to need to figure this out, right? The potential for the cell is equal to the potential of the cathode minus the potential at the anode. Right? So, question, what in the world is going on? <laughs> okay. What does our equation tell us? It tells us that we have some europium at two plus, right? And it's reacting with nickel at two plus, okay? And it goes to make europium three plus and nickel solid. What is the two bits of important information that you need to be able to, for, for this problem, what are the two important bits of information you need to be able to extract from that balance equation. Um, the, where reduction happens. The where the reduction happens and where the oxidation. oxidation happens. What is getting reduced and what is getting oxidized. Now again, I know I made this point earlier, but what tool do you guys have to use to figure that out? Calculating the oxidation states. Got it. So if you know the oxidation states, you can see what gets reduced and what gets oxidized. Now fortunately, for most of the stuff in this chapter, they already give you the oxidation states, right? The two plus and the three plus, and things turn into a solid, and anything in its solid form, right, in its elemental solid form is gonna be zero, right? So what's happening then? What's getting reduced here? Well, nickel goes from two plus to zero, so it's getting reduced, good? What does it mean? Who cares if nickel's getting reduced? It means that it happens at the cathode, right? So we know that nickel gets reduced, so it has to be this part of our equation here, which means the europium has to be the anode. Got it? So bringing in this value, right, 0 0.07 volts is equal to the nickel, right, half reaction, right, minus what's going on, or what's uh, the europium half reaction. Right, you're just subtracting the values there for the half reactions. And so now you go look in the table. Can you guys find this on your table? Yeah, right, nickel's in there. And if I pull out the right value, I got uh, negative 0.28, right? 0.07 volts, you know, negative, right? 
minus um, E and O, right? Good? So what is E of the anode equal to then? I just pulled this, maybe, you know, maybe they were just picking something different, but let me see what's, uh, what the chart says. So I was wondering, is it not a constant thing? It should be, but maybe they, uh, maybe something changed along the line here. Let's see, where is lithium on here? Nickel is, yeah. Yeah, there's nickel, I'm looking for you, lithium. Am I blind? I don't see you. Okay. But you said you found it somewhere online? And... I found one for nickel. Oh, oh, sorry. I thought you said you wrote me my apologies. Okay, let me take a peek at this again. <laughs> I completely misunderstood you there. Then I'm just, I'm just deaf. There's nickel, negative 0.26. Good. Yes? So it's not, is every chart going to be? It should be the same. Those are all constants, yeah. Oh, yep. Negative 0.25, crap, I'm lying to you guys, man. All right, so I just I just pulled the wrong number then, right? So let's see here. So this was, like, let's say 0.26 then, all right. So then my answer changes to 3.3, right? Yeah, okay. I planned that for you guys. <laughs> Sorry, but anyway, the, the point is the same here, right? We just grab that information from the chart. Question, does my answer make sense? Does this answer make sense? Hmm, what does this mean, right? So if you think about what's going on with this reaction, something is getting reduced and something is getting oxidized, right? So something is an oxidizing agent and something is a reducing agent. What's a better reducing agent? Or excuse me, what's a better oxidizing agent? Nickel or europium? Nickel. How do you know? Because it's um, basically not as high as that. Perfect, right? So this is exactly what we were just asked in the previous problem there. So when you calculate a problem like this, make sure that you check your answer at the end, right? If this is the cathode, right? This is a thing that's getting reduced. It should be easier to reduce this than this, okay? Everybody following along with this? And we're just looking at what our answers are at the end there, the E naughts. Sound good? Cool. All right, I think that's a good place to stop. We'll, work, we'll continue working a couple more practice problems on uh, Monday there, and then Wednesday of next week, uh, we'll have our quiz for chapter 20. And uh, then also next week we'll launch into the organic-ish part that we'll talk about. Sound good? No equations, no math, and all of the organic part. You guys aren't thrilled. Okay, I'll find some math in there. We'll just do intervals for fun. Okay. <laughs> I will see you guys on Monday. Have a good, have a good weekend.